not the one for the seminar. Let me see. All right, let me try to figure out if I can start the streaming from here. But in the meantime, maybe, okay, give me a couple of minutes. Sorry, Philip, for the convenience. Uh, I think Zoom has a new uh, version out and it's messing up. Uh, oh, we are online, we are live, cool. Excellent. We are live, we are live? okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, sorry about it. So welcome everyone to this Quantum Matter Seminar with Phil Werner. Uh, really nice to have you today with us, Phil. To talk about the non equilibrium green functions here method that sounds really really interesting so the stage is all yours and uh if anyone has a question during a few talk feel free to unmute yourself and do your question and people watching us on the youtube can also send a question so we will read it for you thank you very much everyone and feel feel free to start okay yeah thank you christian thank you oh. Thank you, Adrian, for the invitation to uh, speak here in this seminar. So let me try to, oh, maybe the host needs to enable screen sharing or something like this. Is that possible? Please double check if you are the co-host. Oh, you're the guest. So I need to call. Sorry about it. Now you're co host, so you have the permission. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just need to find my talk. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, good, great. So, yes, um, I hope you can see the mouse. Can you see them? Okay. Yes, we can. Great. Um, so, yes, um, I will uh, try to give a kind of broad overview of what a non equilibrium dynamical mean field theory, which allows to study the non equilibrium properties of lattice models and correlated materials. And uh, the reason why we are interested in these uh, non equilibrium phenomena is because experimental groups are starting to explore uh, this non-equilibrium phenomena in solids. And nowadays, the time resolution of these experiments reaches a few femtoseconds, which is fast enough that one can directly measure the excitation and relaxation processes on the intrinsic time scale of the electrons. Um, a typical pump probe experiment is sketched here. The material is driven out of its equilibrium state by a strong laser pulse, the pump pulse, and then the properties of this excited material are studied with probe pulses that reach the sample with a well controlled time delay. And one hope in doing these experiments is that they allow to disentangle competing or cooperative effects along the time axis. For example, if um, an electronic ordering uh, transition couples to the lattice, and it's often difficult in equilibrium to understand what is the electronic or phononic contribution to this uh, order. But if electrons and phonons have different characteristic time scales, then by doing these types of experiments, one can hope to understand what is the relative importance of the two contributions. What is even more interesting is the uh, attempt of actively tuning material properties by laser driving. And here we are in particular interested in the enhancement and control of electronic orders such as superconductivity. And in fact, there were uh, various experiments in the last years which suggest that it may be possible to induce high temperature superconductivity by laser driving. Here is a, an experiment from uh, Migrano and co workers in the group of uh, Andrea Cavalieri at that time, which was performed on the fluoride superconductor K360. This material goes superconducting in equilibrium around 20 Kelvin. And what the top panels here uh, show is how the optical conductivity changes in equilibrium if we go from above TC to below TC. And you see that uh, what happens is that in the real part of the conductivity, a gap is opening, and in the imaginary part, a one or omega type divergence appears. 
And very uh, interestingly, in the laser breathing system, similar changes can be induced transiently at temperatures which are far above the equilibrium superconducting transition temperature. Already a few years before these experiments, uh, similar effects have been demonstrated in cuprates, uh, for example, by Kaiser and co workers. In these experiments, uh, they were exciting the material with terahertz uh, pulses, which coupled the certain phoneme modes. And then they found uh, changes in the optical properties, which suggest that the material uh, transiently switches into a superconducting state. And this can be observed in undoped cuprates up to very high temperatures. There are also very interesting experiments which have nothing to do with superconductivity. For example, the group of uh, Dragan Mihailovich has shown that a polaronic mod insulator, tantalum disulfide, can be reversibly switched into and out of a so-called hidden state. That is a long-lived non-thermal state, which, uh, has, which cannot be accessed via a thermal pathway. Um, for example, um, this uh, hidden state is metallic in contrast to the uh, low temperature equilibrium state, which is not insulating. And it also has a slightly different structure from any known um, equilibrium phase. Here are the experimental results, which show how this material switches into this polaronic mod insulator state at low temperature with a high resistance. And then if they apply a very short 30 femtosecond laser pulse to this material, it can be switched into this hidden state, which is metallic and with a low resistance. And then the material can be uh, switched back to the high temperature equilibrium state by other laser pulses or by heating. And this uh, cycle can be repeated many times. And the Mihailovich group has already uh, produced a memory device which uh, operates uh, based on this uh, switching into and out of the hidden state. And this is a memory device which works at an unprecedented speed. So many orders of magnitude faster switching times than uh, semiconductor based memory devices. And also this device has a very low power consumption. So this example shows that having access, in, uh, access to and control over these uh, non-equilibrium phases of correlated matter may very well have future uh, technological applications. Now, uh, obviously these experiments raise many interesting uh, questions from the theory point of view. And so let me uh, briefly summarize what are the challenges from the point of view of theory and numerics. One big challenge is that we are dealing with strongly interacting many particle systems, which are already difficult to treat in equilibrium. Second, we have to deal with strong perturbations. So the laser pulses which are applied to these systems are strong. So we have to uh, describe these uh, perturbed systems much beyond the linear response regime. And uh, finally, and maybe least obvious, um, there is a challenge because uh, these perturbed correlated lattice systems often exhibit different relevant time scales. This is sketched in this uh, figure, which I took from our uh, radio article on this topic. And what it's supposed to show is that a material um, which is driven by a laser uh, pulse is excited on a time scale of the basically uh, electronic hopping time, which is of the order of femtoseconds. And if the laser pulse contains many cycles, the material can transiently switch into a so-called Floquet state, which can have properties very different from those of the equilibrium system. Once the pulse is over, the system starts to relax, but also this relaxation pr process typically proceeds in uh, several stages. Typically, one initially observes the so-called uh, pre-thermalization, that's the relaxation of the system into a state where, for example, the local observables look thermalized, while the non-local observables are still far from thermalized. And if the system has long range order, there can be 
uh, slowdowns in the uh, relaxation due to non thermal fixed points, and the full thermalization process typically happens on time scales, which can be orders of magnitude longer than the time scales needed to describe the initial excitation uh, process. And to bridge all these time scales in a single simulation is a very big challenge. And um, what I want to discuss today is the dynamical mean field formalism, which is one of the promising schemes for these types of uh, problems. And they allow, this uh, scheme allows us to at least go uh, relatively far in this diagram and describe um, various stages in this uh, uh, excitation and relaxation dynamics. Before I uh, start to introduce the dynamical mean field formalism, let me remind you of something that everybody knows, that is the static mean field theory for the Ising model. In this uh, theory, we map the lattice of interacting spins to a single side effective model, which consists of a single spin in an effective magnetic field. And this magnetic field is computed self-consistently in such a way that it mimics the effect of the red spins on the black spin here. And this is calculated by an iterative procedure where we impose as a self-consistency condition that the local magnetization of the lattice model is the same as the magnetization of the single side model. Now, dynamical mean field theory is an attempt to formulate a similar type of description for a correlated fermionic lattice model, like the Hubbard model, where electrons hop around a lattice with some uh, kinetic energy or hopping parameter T, and they interact locally, say, with a repulsion energy U. Again, the idea is to map this lattice problem to a single side effective model, and in this case, the effective model is a so-called quantum purity model, which consists of a single uh, correlated site embedded in an uncorrelated mass of electrons. And uh, the plan is now to optimize the parameters of this path so that this path here mimics the lattice environment. And this is again done uh, in an iterative procedure where we impose as a self-consistency condition that the local lattice greens function is the same as the impurity greens function. And in order to be able to close this uh, self-consistency, we have to make an, uh, an assumption at the level of the self-energy. The self-energy is the quantity which describes how the interaction effects change the propagation of the electrons in the solid. And we have to assume that this self-energy is completely local and uh, can be identified with the impurity self-energy. Under these conditions, we can close uh, this self-consistency loop. In practice, we often work in an action formulation where we integrate out the bath and replace it by a so-called hybridization function, which describes how the electrons hop in and out of the bath as a function of time. And this hybridization function plays the role of the mean field in this theory, and uh, that's the quantity which is adjusted self-consistently. And because this is a time-dependent mean field, we call this theory a dynamical mean field theory. The self-consistency loop uh, for this theory is uh, described here. We start from some initial guess for the hybridization function, then we solve the impurity model that gives us the Green's function and the self-energy of the impurity problem. And then we make this uh, essential approximation that we assume that the self-energy of the lattice system is local and can be approximated by this impurity self-energy. And with this, we can then calculate the lattice screens function and the local lattice screens function. And then we can impose the self-consistency condition, which demands that the local lattice screens function is the same as the impurity screens function. And with this, we can obtain a new hybridization function and then iterate this loop until convergence is reached. The difficult step in this uh, calculation is the solution 
of the impurity uh, model. I myself have worked a lot on uh, techniques for solving impurity models, but uh, this is not what I want to uh, discuss right now. Instead, I want to basically describe now how we can extend this formalism to time-dependent problems. And for this, I have to introduce the concept of a carbon of bind contour. So let us assume that the initial state of our system is described by a density matrix for, of zero, where zero here describes uh, or refers to time zero. And that's uh, the definition of this density matrix. If we now want to describe the state of the system at some other time t, we have to compute the time evolved density matrix row of t, which can be obtained from this uh, density matrix row of zero by multiplying with these uh, time evolution operators on the left and the right. And these time evolution operators are time ordered or anti time ordered exponentials, as shown in this slide. With this time evolved density matrix, we can then obtain time dependent expectation values of some local observable O by computing the trace of density matrix times O. And now we insert this uh, product here for the time evolved density matrix. And we can use the cyclic property of the trace to move the red factor to the right hand side. And then we end up with this expression here for uh, the time dependent expectation value, where I have uh, replaced the density matrix by its uh, definition. Now we may um, express these time evolution operators as time ordered and anti time ordered exponentials. And we can also express the initial density matrix as an imaginary time ordered exponential. And now you can see that the calculation of this expectation value at time t involves the propagation along a three-legged contour in the complex time plane. Namely, we first propagate forward along the real-time axis from time zero to time t. And we measure the observable at time t. Then we propagate back along the real-time axis to zero. And finally, we propagate along the imaginary time axis to minus i beta, where beta is the inverse temperature of our initial equilibrium state. To simplify this uh, uh, formalism, we can define a contour ordering operator tau c, which orders our creation and annihilation operators uh, along this contour as indicated by these arrows. And with this uh, contour operating a uh, contour ordering operator, we can now express the time dependent expectation value simply as uh, basically uh, expectation value like uh, shown here, a contour ordered uh, expectation value. And this contour ordering formalism can be then easily extended also to two point functions as shown in this uh, expression here. And the two point function, which will be relevant uh, for dynamic midfield theory, is the Griggs function, which is now the contour ordered uh, expectation value of d and d dagger, where d and d dagger are the impurity or, or lattice creation and annihilation operators. So, now what is non equilibrium dynamic midfield theory? Non equilibrium dynamical mean field theory is nothing else than dynamical mean field theory uh, implemented on this cutting of bind contour using non equilibrium grids functions. In particular, the mapping from the lattice model to the single side impurity model is exactly the same as in equilibrium. And also, the different steps in the self consistency cycle are formally exactly the same. Nevertheless, these calculations are considerably more difficult than uh, equilibrium DMFT calculations. So let us try to understand why this is the case. Um, as you can see, these hybridization functions 
Green's functions and self energies, they are now functions of two separate time arguments, T and T prime, instead of a time difference as in equilibrium. And that's because a generic uh, non equilibrium state is not time translation invariant. So we have to store these uh, quantities as matrices rather than vectors. And this already implies a much bigger memory demand, for example, to store these objects. And also um, the solution of a Dyson equation, which we can formally write like this, is uh, more complicated in non equilibrium situations. So we cannot simply go to Fourier space and then compute this type of inverse easily as we can do uh, in equilibrium, but we have to write this type of equation as an integral differential equation on the cardinal of time contour and then solve this equation using appropriate uh, techniques. But the biggest uh, hurdle as in equilibrium is the solution of the impurity problem and that becomes even more um, difficult in non-equilibrium situations than it is already in equilibrium. Let me uh, explain a few methods which we have implemented and used in the context of non-equilibrium uh, DNFT calculations. One method is the adaptation of the weak coupling continuous time Monte Carlo technique to non-equilibrium problems. For this, we uh, go back to this expression here for the time dependent expectation value of our observable O. And what we do now is we switch to an interaction representation where the time evolution between operators is given by the quadratic part of the impurity Hamiltonian. And in this expression, uh, in this uh, representation, uh, what remains in the time ordered exponentials is the interaction part of the Hamiltonian. And what we can now do is we can expand these time ordered exponentials in powers of the uh, interaction term. And then at the given order in the expansion, we obtain a collection of interaction vertices on this cardinal prime contour. And because the time propagation between these vertices is given by a quadratic Hamiltonian, we can integrate out the fermions and use a Wick theorem. Um, and then basically we obtain the diagrams which consist of interaction vertices linked by non-interacting bath Green's functions. Now we can implement the Monte Carlo sampling and generate uh, all the relevant diagrams stochastically and measure their contribution to the observable of interest. Some people may spot the potential problem with this algorithm. Namely, you can see um, that these vertices on the real time branches that they come with complex uh, factors minus and plus i. And also these non-equilibrium grades functions are complex valued functions. So in this Monte Carlo sample, we have complex weights. And um, that implies that there is a sign problem. And this sign problem gets more and more severe as we extend this contour and insert more and more operators on the real time contour. And so in practice, this type of uh, Monte Carlo approach is limited to relatively short times. For many applications, it is therefore also useful to uh, develop approximate methods, which allow us uh, to do calculations more cheaply and to access longer times. And for example, we have uh, also used the strong coupling perturbation theory, which is based on a pseudoparticle uh, formalism. We introduce so-called pseudoparticle Green's functions for the all the local states of our problem for the single band the Hubble model, this would be these four local states. And then we introduce a pseudoparticle self energy, which in the simplest case is the product of pseudoparticle Green's function and the hybridization function. And then if we plug this 
self-energy into a solid particle rising equation, we can generate in the end um, all diagrammatic uh, contributions uh, to the uh, Green's function, which are of this form here. So basically, these correspond to the hybridization expansion diagrams, which do not involve any crossing hybridization lines. If we uh, add a second order diagram of this type uh, to the uh, self energy, we can um, generate then all the contributions from the hybridization expansion, uh, which involve at most one crossing. And that's why kind of this simple approximation is called the non crossing approximation. And this uh, next order approximation is called the one crossing approximation. But we can, in principle, also go to second order, uh, to the third order in the hybridization and so forth. And here's a little test um, of these approximations. What is plotted is uh, a quench, or what we simulate here is a quench in the Hubbard model, where we suddenly uh, change the interaction from, say, three to four or from three to five. And what is plotted is the time evolution of the average double occupation in the lattice model as a function of time. And the blue dots, these are the exact DMFT results obtained with the Monte Carlo method, which I have briefly explained. The uh, violet curve, this is the non-crossing approximation result, which is very bad, especially because the initial state is not uh, well uh, described. But already the second order one-crossing approximation result is qualitatively quite good. And the third order result is then completely on top of the Monte Carlo simulations. And because this is cheaper numerically than the Monte Carlo approach, we can push these simulations to somewhat longer times. Now, um, these are uh, methods which we have implemented more than 10 years ago and which have served as well for many uh, years. But let me also uh, give you a bit of a, an idea of some more recent developments which are going on right now in my group, namely together with Martin Eckstein and my postdoc, Martin Kim, we are uh, in the process of developing a new type of uh, impurity solver based on the higher order vertex functions. Namely, we can make this uh, non-crossing approximation exact by adding a second diagram, which involves a uh, three leg or three point vertex, which is sketched here by this gray uh, triangle. And this three point vertex approximately satisfies this type of self-consistent equation. And now we can solve this equation. We can plug the vertex into this uh, expression for the self energy. And with this, we can obtain the pseudo particle grains function. This defines the black lines here in these diagrams, and then we can again solve this uh, equation here and uh, iterate this scheme. And this gives us uh, uh, an, approximate, an approximate solution, which goes far beyond this uh, first, second, or third order scheme that I have shown on the previous slide. And we can even go one step further, and we can make this scheme exact by adding two more diagrams, which involve a four-point vertex. And now the idea is to use uh, the diagrammatic Monte Carlo approach to stochastically sample all the relevant diagrammatic contributions to this four-point vertex and then plug it into this self-consistency scheme. And we have already a running uh, uh, code for the simple case of the spin boson uh, model uh, in equilibrium at the moment. So uh, in this case, the Green's function is the spin-spin correlation function. And for the given parameters here, the exact solution is the black line. And you can see in red, the non-crossing approximation to this problem, which is very bad. Uh, the one crossing approximation slightly corrects it, but uh, it's still pretty poor. Then the green line shows this uh, self-consistent three point vertex approximation. And once we add the four-point vertex, we can make this uh, scheme exact. 
and uh, what is Can I ask a quick question here, Philip? Yes, 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 please. So the um, the exact that's continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, or what is? No, that uh, that's actually a, a, an exactly solvable problem. Uh, just a, a spin coupled to a single boson mode. So we, we solve it by exact itemization in this case. Okay. So this well, was just a kind of a, a test, yeah. Okay. And then, so what is the um, relative speed of the exact solution versus this four point vertex solution? Like how much gain are you getting there? Yeah, of course, this is uh, extremely cheap. Uh, this is still very cheap. Uh, this is getting uh, more expensive and, and this is far, far more expensive. Of course, once we start to, once we start to do this uh, Monte Carlo sample, that, then the scheme becomes really expensive. But already the solution of this uh, equation is, is not totally cheap. I mean, the, the idea is to represent this as a, well, let's say this equation, is, we represent these uh, vertices as matrices and then we write this as a matrix equation and then we have to basically invert the large matrix. So, but, but how does it compare still, to the exact diagonalization? I mean, is it still, uh, the four point, is that still much Oh, no, 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 of course, no, no, of course, for this, uh, for this particular problem, uh, the exact diagonalization is, is much cheaper, but uh, we, we just use this simple problem because it's hard for, for our approach, but simple for this exact diagonalization approach. But, the, but what we are ultimately interested in is a generic spin boson model, which kind of couples to a, a continuum of bosons. And this type of problem is then not uh, so easily solvable. But you are right, in equilibrium, we could still basically do something similar to the hybridization expansion, which would be uh, cheaper, numerically uh, cheaper than this approach. But our hope is uh, that this approach can be implemented also for non-equilibrium problems, because basically this um, Maybe you have heard some talks by Nikolai Prokofiev and others about this diagrammatic Monte Carlo scheme. This is a scheme which in some sense profits from the sign problem. Um, the sign problem here basically suppresses the contributions from the high order diagrams. And so we already have a sign problem in equilibrium, which we have to deal with and which we can deal with as this uh, example here shows. And our hope is that the sign problem uh, out of equilibrium is not much more uh, severe than the sign problem in equilibrium and so so that's yeah that's that's why we are investing in this in this method okay great but, thank you but uh, yeah the, it remains to be seen how well it works out of equilibrium we have not not done this yet anyhow yeah that's just a a, a, a brief overview of over some methods which have been uh, tried or which are under development. Uh, what I also want to say is that out of equilibrium, even the solution of the Dyson equation is not uh, computationally cheap. Uh, we have to solve this, as I mentioned, as an integral differential equation on this uh, Karpinov time contour. And in this uh, equation, basically, the self energy plays the role of a memory kernel. And uh, by basically looking at this equation, one can find that the computational effort uh, scales like the third power of the basically number of time steps that we have on the real time axis. So how this works in practice is as follows. We start from the solution on the imaginary time axis. That's the usual equilibrium DMFT uh, calculation. And then we extrapolate uh, this solution to the first time step on the real time axis, and we solve these types of Dyson equations and the DMFT um, uh, problem up to the first time step until uh, it is converged. And then we extrapolate the next time step, iterate these equations, and so forth. But yeah, as you, as you can see here already, the solution of the Dyson equation scales like the third power, and it scales. Yeah, in the same way as, for example, the, the NCA equation uh, scales. So uh, it's, not, it's not cheap. And so this by itself uh, also uh, often limits the simulation or kind of yeah, the times which we can access in these simulations. 
However, there are some uh, ideas how to reduce uh, this computational cost. For example, a few years ago, we have shown that in many uh, non-equilibrium situations, uh, this memory time is actually not so long. It's this this self-energy decay fast. And then what we can do is we can simply truncate the memory time in this uh, integral here, and then the scaling uh, is reduced, and this allows us to, to propagate. Uh, yeah, basically we can reduce the scaling to linear in, in time, and then we can propagate the solution to much longer times. And that has been, meanwhile been done in a couple of applications, but we have not yet really systematically incorporated this into our uh, uh, standard library. And this brings me to this, this slide here, namely this non-equilibrium Green's function calculations, including the solutions of these uh, types of Dyson equations. Um, these are in principle well-known algorithms, which one, one uh, uh, yeah, uses here, but these algorithms are quite tedious to implement, especially if one wants to use a high order accuracy uh, in the time stepping. Uh, and so after many years of developing and implementing these techniques, we have uh, recently published a library in AC, non equilibrium system simulation library, which provides the core functionalities that are needed for these types of non equilibrium uh, uh, Prince function calculations, including the solution of, of Dyson equations. So if you or your uh, students want to do non equilibrium Prince function calculations, I uh, suggest that you have a look at this uh, library. This could make your life uh, much easier. Okay, um, now as with any new method, uh, it is important to benchmark the accuracy of this method. And uh, in the case of non-equilibrium evolution of lattice problems, there are not so many other techniques which we could uh, kind of benchmark against. One exception are one-dimensional systems uh, where the so-called density matrix renormalization group technique allows to compute essentially exact results at least up to uh, a certain time. And so what we have done here, we have teamed up with a DMRG expert, Peter Baumettler, uh, to compare DMFT against the DMRG for the one-dimensional Hubbard model. And what is plotted here in this slide is uh, the result of an interaction quench from zero to one. And what is plotted is again the double occupation as a function of time after the quench. And this black curve here, this is the exact reference obtained from the MRG and the red curve shows the result we obtained by the MFT. And you can see it's kind of similar, but not very good. And that's not surprising because uh, I have mentioned this approximation which we have to make to we assume that the self energy is completely local in the MFT, and that's an approximation which is good in high dimensional systems, but it is not expected to work very well in low dimensional systems, and in particular in one dimension. In these low dimensional systems, uh, short range uh, correlations play a, a big role, and um, what we can do in order to capture these is we can, instead of a single site, we can embed a small cluster of a few sites into a self consistently computed medium. And thereby, we can then uh, capture explicitly the short range uh, correlations on the cluster and we treat longer range correlations on the mean field level. That's the so called uh, cluster extension of dynamical mean field theory. And in this uh, figure, you can see how the result improves. If you go from single side DMFT to four side cluster DMFT, eight side, six side cluster DMFT, eventually we reproduce uh, the exact uh, dynamics up to a certain time, at least. So uh, this provides at least in principle a path forward if we want to uh, include also the effect of short range. Uh, correlations, which can be significant, as you can see here. Of course, the computational cost also goes up very significantly, but 
um, at least with the techniques that we have uh, developed over the years, we can nowadays do uh, foresight cluster calculations uh, quite uh, easily. So that's that's feasible. But, but large clusters is still kind of a, a difficult problem. Now, when it comes to three-dimensional systems, there's really not uh, any other method that I can think of which could give us uh, exact reference data for strongly perturbed uh, lattice uh, problems. So we decided to benchmark DMFT against cold atom simulators. As you may know, cold atom groups, they can kind of implement a Harvard model in their laboratory. And some groups like the uh, tilman esslinger group at ETH, they can also mimic the effect of electric field excitations by shaking uh, their lattice in a, in a clever way. And so what we have done here, we teamed up with tilman esslingers group uh, to benchmark the NFT against cold atom simulators for the problem of resonantly excited mod insulators. So we <clears throat> consider here a mod insulating Hubbard model, which is driven with a frequency equal to U. And this uh, strongly excites uh, double and hole pairs in this mod insulator. And what is plotted here is the number of doublons as a function of uh, time uh, for different uh, strength of the excitation pulse and for different lengths yeah, of the excitation pulses. And we have taken here on the DMFT simulation the same lattice, the same uh, trap, the same, uh, of course, a uh, ramp protocol and so forth. So we should be uh, directly able to compare these uh, simulation results to the experiment at least up to about 10 milliseconds. Beyond 10 milliseconds, there will be redistributions of atoms in the trap and also atom losses then for longer times. But uh, for the shorter times, we should be able to directly compare this. And you can see uh, the comparison is quite good. And I would optimistically claim that the remaining discrepancies, which we see here, are coming from uh, difficulties in estimating the initial entropy in the experiment. What I learned from these collaborations that these experiments are actually very difficult and in particular, the, this uh, calculation of the initial entropy or temperature of the system is complicated and involves a certain amount of modeling. And I think that's more or less where the uncertainty comes in. But yeah, <clears throat> apart from uh, these small discrepancies, I think we can say that the agreement is fairly good. And this gives us some confidence that after 10 years or more of uh, developing this non-equilibrium DMFT, we now have a tool which can really give us uh, predictive um, accuracy for at least a very strongly uh, driven correlated lattice systems like the ones we, which we studied here in this uh, collaboration. And so with this, let us then go back to the topic of my introduction, which was light-induced electronic orders. And let us ask, what can we learn uh, now from DMFT calculations about the possible emergence of uh, light-induced electronic orders. And here one uh, recent thing which we learned from uh, our DMFT studies is that it is possible to cool down a correlated electron system or even a non-correlated electron system by photodoping. Um, and to show this, we considered the following setup. We have a completely filled band initially. And we have, a, say, a Hubbard model, which is partially filled in the initial uh, state. And then we uh, excite electrons from this uh, field band to our Hubbard model by dipolar uh, excitations, uh, where the frequency of the laser pulse is, is chosen such that we effectively uh, shift up this uh, full band and then uh, electrons can be doped from the full band into this uh, partially filled band. And uh, what is then important here is that initially the entropy of this full band is zero because all the states are filled. But if we dope holes into this initially full 
and the entropy goes up very fast. And if you now imagine that we can implement this uh, photodoping process in such a way that the total entropy of the system, which means the entropy of this, say, core band and this system here is conserved, then the increase of the entropy in this core band implies a decrease of the entropy in the system. So there is a substantial entropy reshuffling from our system to the core band, and this allows the system to cool down. And this cooling effect is, is pretty strong, and it allows us to break uh, symmetries. For example, in this simulation, we started at the temperature above the highest uh, nail temperature in the system, and we applied a small uh, stack of magnetic field as a seed. And then uh, during the photodoping pulse, we cool down the system enough that we go into the antiferromagnetic phase, we break the symmetry. And uh, even after the photodoping pulse, basically the symmetry broken state persists, uh, at least up to uh, the time where these uh, double and hole pairs or these electron hole pairs will start to recombine. At that point, then the, the cooling effect will disappear and the system will actually uh, heat up. But uh, as long as uh, these uh, holes persist in, 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 the, in the core band, uh, we can realize a very strong uh, cooling effect in the system. And in this case, for example, uh, induce antiferromagnetic order. We can also use this trick to realize um, completely non-thermal symmetry uh, breakings, such as the eta parent state in the strongly repulsive Hubbard model. Uh, this is a superconducting state with a stack of order parameter, which does not exist in equilibrium states, but it has been predicted to exist in uh, strongly repulsive Hubbard models with a strongly inverted population. It's so what I have done here in this uh, simulation is uh, I basically uh, produced a population inversion by photo excitation from full bands and uh, also into empty bands. And then uh, by the combined effect of this inversion and the entropy cooling, which is associated with the entropy transfer from our system to these initially full and empty bands, we can create the cold population inverted state. And you can see here the evolution of the double occupation. That's how the basically population inversion is building up during the pulse. And once we have an essentially inverted state, you can see that the eta pairing order parameter grows. And then after the pulse, this uh, eta pairing order parameter is conserved. And we can directly prove that this is a superconducting state by applying a short half cycle field pulse to the system. And you can see that after such a pulse, the current does not decay, which uh, shows that this is a superconducting state. So that's uh, nice. We can actually now uh, explicitly prepare the eta paired state uh, in, a, in a Harvard model, thanks to this uh, trick. Finally, I want to also show that we can use the spin degree of freedom as an entropy sink. This was a recent project uh, where we looked at the two orbital Hubbard model with crystal field splitting and hood coupling. Now, uh, if we first look at the atomic limit, uh, you can easily understand that for large crystal field, we are in a uh, low uh, spin uh, state with a local entropy of zero, whereas for small uh, crystal field splitting, we are in a high spin state uh, with a local entropy of three because there are three triplet states. And at some uh, value of the crystal field splitting, there will be a level crossing or spin, tra uh, spin state transition from the low spin uh, to the high spin state. Now, uh, what was uh, realized a few years ago by Jan Kunesh and others is that the lattice model in the vicinity of the spin state transition is unstable to excitonic order. The excitonic insulator phase is a, is a phase with a spontaneous uh, electron hole pairing. So it's very uh, conceptually closely related to superconductivity, but it involves electron hole pairs instead of electron, electron pairs. 
And in this case, we have a kind of a spin triplet uh, order parameter. And what we did in this um, calculation now is we started again from a temperature which was above the highest excitonic insulator uh, transition temperature. We started in the low spin insulator, then we reduced the level splitting to quench into the region where excitonic insulator exists in equilibrium and then indeed by the kind of effect of spin entropy cooling, we could break the symmetry as you can see here from the trajectory of the complex order parameter for this excitonic insulator. And we basically uh, break the symmetry into an excitonic insulator state. And that's because uh, we are building up some high spin uh, configurations and this has a large spin entropy and this effect uh, is enough to cool down our, our system enough to, to break the symmetry into this excitonic insulator phase. Now, even more interesting uh, is the fact that we found that if we quench beyond the regime where the excitonic insulator phase exists in equilibrium, we can still uh, break the symmetry and we can realize that transient uh, excitonic insulator state with a large order parameter, but this is a completely non thermal form of excitonic insulator, as you can already guess here from the qualitatively different uh, trajectory of the order parameter in this uh, complex plane. And by analyzing the problem in some, some detail, we found that the mechanism which leads to this symmetry breaking is not, not the one uh, that we had here, entropy cooling, but it's something which we call entropy trapping, namely, we start here in an initial state with a low entropy and under the time evolution, this low entropy is approximately conserved because of some uh, thermalization bottleneck. And this thermalization bottleneck uh, enables this uh, breaking of the, the symmetry, this transient emergence of a completely non-thermal excitonic uh, insulator phase. So that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And so finally, let us ask, does any of this have some uh, relation to the experiment, to the two experiments that I uh, mentioned in the beginning? Let's start with the uh, light in this superconductivity experiment by Mitrano and co cost on, on K3C60. In fact, some entropy cooling ideas have already been proposed in connection with this experiment by uh, Michele Fabrizio and co cost. And what these authors have proposed is that the laser driving in this system excites spin triplet excitons. And because these triplet excitons have a high entropy, they should be able to cool down the quasi particles. And that might be enough to explain the emergence of this uh, transient superconducting state in the laser driven material. Also in connection with the Kubrick experiments, there have been uh, similar ideas um, proposed by Dieter Jaksch and co workers These uh, experiments are on bilayer cuprates, which one can uh, describe as a stack of strong and weak Josephson junctions. And what Jaksch and co workers have proposed is that uh, what the laser driving does is it cools down the weak Josephson junctions at the expense of heating up the strong Josephson junctions. So there's a kind of entropy reshuffling from weak to strong uh, Josephson junctions. And because the weak junction limits the TC, this entropy reshuffling may explain the enhancement of TC in the light uh, driven state. So both these uh, theory papers by uh, Fabrizio and the co workers and by Yaksh and co workers, these are very uh, interesting papers which propose, I think, conceptually uh, interesting and appealing ideas. But it's also fair to say that these papers didn't really support these ideas with very uh, serious calculations. But now, uh, in, in this talk, I have shown you that with the help of non equilibrium dynamical mean field theory, which is one of the most uh, powerful formalisms which we have at our disposal right now, we can actually see. Uh, similar effects, uh, quite strong effects, 
related to entropy cooling and that we can uh, exploit this to break uh, transient with the symmetry in laser driven or otherwise perturbed materials. So I'm quite confident that uh, with this technique and uh, with some more work, uh, we may eventually be uh, able to understand what is really going on in these uh, experiments and how one may guide uh, future experiments, which can maybe search for other types of non-thermal symmetry broken states. And with this, I'm done. Let me just uh, uh, list here this uh, review paper. It's already a few years old, but I think it's still a very good reference to start if you are interested in non-equilibrium dynamic mean field theory. I also list again this uh, uh, link here to the library if you are interested in uh, performing non-equilibrium Prince function calculations. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, which have done most of the, uh, the hard work uh, and which have significantly contributed to the development of non equilibrium dynamic mean field theory. Martin Eckstein, Naoto Tsuchi, Hugo Strand, Dennis Golles, Michael Schiller, and Jutta Novakan. I think these are all really uh, world leading experts in the field of non equilibrium. EMFT, and they have meanwhile moved on to nice other uh, places. And with this, I uh, thank you for your attention and ready for questions.